Carmen. Thank you for that. I'm not used to talking into a microphone, so it should be interesting to get used to. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Cool. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Dustin Norman. I'm the Morning Coronation Meteorologist and uh, for the time being, the Acting Meteorologist in Charge at NWS Northern Indiana. <coughs> so I'm gonna uh, talk briefly um, and not get too much into it, but our, organi our organizational structure and these may be a little bit hard for you to see, but I will uh, just briefly discuss um, what we're, who we are and what we belong to. So we are part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. As you break it down, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Here, let me try and just this a little bit. Yeah, and there's also a screen behind you if you're way back uh, in the back there. Um, there are five line offices that are part of NOAA, and that is the National Ocean Service, the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, also known as NESDIS, the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations and NOAA Corps, so this would also uh, be where the hurricane hunters belong to, and then of course us, the National Weather Service. So uh, moving past the Office of Chief Operating Officer, um, we have the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, and under that are a bunch of national centers. So the Storm Prediction Center, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. Um, they're the ones that coordinate uh, severe thunderstorm watches and tornado watches with us. We also have the National Hurricane Center, which some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not. I'm a native Floridian, so I uh, work with them a lot in the past. We have the Aviation Weather Center, which does forecasting for two thirds of the globe. Um, the Climate Prediction Center, the Space Weather Prediction Center, which um, is working very closely with the upcoming eclipse. National uh, Weather Prediction Center, um, the folks that archive a lot of our data, which would be NSEP, and then the Ocean Prediction Center. So moving over on the right, um, under the regional headquarters, is River Forecast Centers, Center Weather Service Units, which do aviation <laughs> forecasting. They work uh, very closely with the FAA. Weather Forecast Offices, so that's us. And I wanna show you briefly um, how we are split up organizationally, or spatially. Um, we have the Alaska Region Headquarters, so we, we have six um, regional headquarters across the country. Uh, no, we don't. We have one, two, three, four, five, yes, yep, six. Sorry, I forgot how to count. We have the Alaska Region Headquarters, which really just does Alaska. We have the Pacific, um, which is Guam, American Samoa, and Hawaii. We have the Western Region and Salt Lake, Central Region, Eastern Region, and Southern Region. And then, of course, our headquarters is in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, we belong to Central Region um, in our forecast office. Breaking that up further, we have 122 forecast offices. Um, you can see here they look a lot like congressional, what happened? <laughs> they look a lot like congressional districts and they are split up. I couldn't tell you why they're split up this way. Um, I know one of the big driving factors is radar location. Um, our office is stuck in the middle of nowhere. Um, we are in Syracuse, Indiana. Has anybody ever heard of Syracuse, Indiana? No, perfect. Um, that's not, wait, we have one, okay. We have one individual. So we have one person that knows where Syracuse, Indiana is and it's in Kosciuszko County right here. Um, as she mentioned, sorry, let me shine right here is where our office is. Um, as Meg mentioned, we have 37 counties that we are responsible for, including a little sliver of Lake Michigan here, so we have some of the marine zone uh, responsibilities here. We have five counties in southern Michigan, eight counties in northwest Ohio, and 24 in northern Indiana. The offices that serve Ohio is me, of course, 
um, Northwest Ohio. Uh, to the south is Bur um, Cincinnati, excuse me, not Cincinnati, they're actually called the Wilmington office, um, but they are close to Cincinnati. They are our state liaison office, so they work closely with Columbus, and they will actually be staffing the Emergency Operations Center um, during the eclipse. Um, we've got Cleveland up to our north, we have Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then Charleston, West Virginia. All right, so some of you may hate me for this, but I cannot talk about the eclipse and how it will affect our weather without first going into why the eclipse um, will lower our temperatures, will affect our wind. So I'm going to give you a Earth's Energy Budget 101. So bear with me. Um, I learned this in school and then had to reteach myself some of it because I promptly forgot it. But I'm gonna have to stand over here because I have each number pop up um, on a separate uh, transition here. So what I'm gonna do is Over the course of a year, the average amount of energy received at the top part of our atmosphere, over one square meter, is about 342 watts. And to easily quantify it, we're going to, and sorry, I, this gets a little mathematical, so I'll, I'll try and not bore you half to death, but you'll see where I'm going with it in a minute. We are going to correlate this 342 watts per meter squared into 100 units, just for simplicity. Okay, so that's where we are going to start with 100. All right, so the amount of radiation coming in from the from the sun is 100 at the top of our atmosphere. 30 units, or 30 percent of that, is going to be scattered. Um, one way or another, whether that's off the Earth's surface or from the clouds or the atmosphere. So we're going to do away with 30, 30 parts of that, okay? Over here, we have 19. 19 is absorbed by the atmosphere itself. And I'll, I'll touch on this in a minute. Um, this is mainly going to be our ozone layer, um, our ultraviolet radiation at the top of the atmosphere, or higher up in the atmosphere. So, where does that leave us? We've got 30 bye bye. We've got 19 absorbed by the atmosphere. At the Earth's surface, we're at 51. Okay? So, 100 starts out, 51 makes it to the surface. It is absorbed uh, by the Earth's surface. Now, we are going to lose 30 at the Earth's surface, and this is going to be 7 plus 23. And again, I'm sorry for the numbers, but we got to do it like this. Um, 30 is lost by either evaporating water or uh, convection and conduction. So convection would be uh, heat kind of bubbling. Think of your uh, clouds that pop up um, on a daily basis or thermals that, you know, gliders ride, etc. So that would be convection. Six units are lost as long wave radiation or infrared radiation. And let me back up for a second. Most of the radiation that reaches the Earth's surface here is what we call short wave radiation or light, right? So think of think of electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation being on a long gamut, different wavelengths. Most of it that reaches our surface is visible light. If it wasn't, we would be dead probably. So it's a good thing that we only get, for the most part, visible light. Six units are emitted back out to space from the Earth as long wave radiation. Think of heat or what we feel as long wave radiation. 111 units and this is where you'll, you'll say, hey, wait, that doesn't make sense. But 111 units is emitted from the Earth back into the atmosphere. Okay? So why is it 111 units? Well, the Earth 
is receiving 51 units from the sun, but it's not 24 hours a day that it's receiving that. However, it's constantly letting out infrared long wave radiation. And that's why the sun goes down, it doesn't immediately hit the low temperature of the day. It starts out warm and it slowly cools off during the day. So it's constantly releasing long wave radiation. 96 units is absorbed by the atmosphere and radiated back to us. Can anybody tell me what that is called? It starts with a G. Hmm? Yeah. No? Any effect? No? It has to do with climate. It's, it's talked a lot. Greenhouse. Greenhouse effect. Thank you. So 96 units out of that 111 that is radiated out, 96 is emitted back to us. Okay, so without that, we would be consistently cooling because you saw we're getting 51 from the sun, we're emitting 111, so we would be really, really cold. So without the greenhouse effect, we would be super cold. But to keep us balanced, right, we are emitting, um, we are receiving 96 units back from our atmosphere. And then 64 units don't really, those, those will matter in a second, but that's 64 is emitted back out to space and we lose that. So I mentioned the greenhouse effect, um, and this, this is kind of related to the eclipse, but this is just also a cool little sub some note. Um, this is what we receive. This graph up here is incoming solar radiation. And so you'll see where it peaks. And I said we receive mostly visible light, right? So this is about 0.4 to 0.7 microns is the wavelength of visible light. We see this is um, O2 and O3. So this is ozone and oxygen. That absorbs most of the uh, most of the ultraviolet and shortwave radiation that the atmosphere or that the sun emits. It also gets a little bit of um, outgoing long wave radiation here, but that's that's neither here nor there. CO two is this one, and you'll see CO two does not absorb anything in the short wave, but it absorbs a lot of the long wave radiation. H2O, water, is our most efficient greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, you'll see uh, H2O or water absorbs much more of the wavelengths than CO2. Now with that said, um, the average gas makeup of the atmosphere is about three to four percent um, water. However, with a warming atmosphere, you're able to hold more water, so you would expect to see more water vapor in the atmosphere. So our total atmosphere, this is what is absorbed, this is what is transmitted. You'll see our atmosphere is not really good at absorbing light, which is good because we need to see, so that's, that's a plus. It protects us from the ultraviolet radiation for the most part, so we don't get burned and, and croak. Uh, microwave radiation, it, blocks a lot of that out, mostly because of water vapor. Um, so that's how kind of our atmosphere works. That's how different constituents inside the atmosphere absorb. And uh, that is why we are neither very hot or very cold. So with that said, um, here is where our balance actually occurs. So 51 make it to the surface, 19 is absorbed. Um, by our atmosphere, six is emitted out to space, and 60, sorry, six is emitted out to space directly from the Earth's surface, and 64 is emitted from the, uh, from the clouds, from the gases. So that is six plus 64 equals 70, 19 plus 51 equals 70, 70 going out, 70 coming in. Yay, we're balanced. 
Okay. So energy budget 101. Sorry if I put you to sleep there, but I feel I felt like that was a, an important part um, as we transition into how the eclipse would affect our surface. So this is a cool thing that I found, and um, unfortunately I wasn't able to find a model for uh, this upcoming eclipse, but this is the 2017 eclipse, and if you uh, don't remember it too well, it entered, I want to say it was somewhere in Oregon, and crossed, traversed the, the United States somewhat like this, and that's a very shaky laser. Um, <laughs> but it traversed from west to southeast. And um, NOAA modeled using the high resolution rapid refresh model, um, they modeled the incoming solar radiation. And so we will, our mind goes to think of totality, right? As totality just being where the sun's not hitting the ground. But when you really think about it, a lot of, well, actually all of the United States will have some level of eclipseness. I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> some level of the sun being blocked out, right? So there's some level of incoming solar radiation that's going to be minimalized. Hello? Karen, go on. There it goes. Cool. Oh, is it? Oh, that's what. Okay. Hello? <laughs> technology. Technology. Yeah, I love it. It's better than the technology in the federal government. That's, it's always much quicker to break. All right, so where was I? Um, the eclipseness. Okay, perfect, the word I made up. So all of the globe, or sorry, all the United States will receive some level of um, sun being blocked out. And so some amount of that incoming solar radiation is going to be reduced. So check out this model. So you'll see the sun rises across the US and then right now it starts to block out Okay, and I'll, I'll play that again. And you'll see where totality is. It's really like right in here. So the effect is much farther reaching than that, right? So I thought this was just a, a neat way of looking um, at it. And you can even see where, and this is strictly just a model. This is not exactly what happened. They're just modeling it. Um, you can see where some of the clouds, because these are, these are clouds here blocking the incoming solar radiation. You'll see some convection starting to fire up here. And then it gets lessened, right? And then they start to fire back up. I'll show you a example of the 2017 eclipse where the cloud cover um, was reduced in a second. I want to show you um, some temperature graphs. And so I got these from the Paducah, Kentucky office um, that was in the path of totality during the 27 total solar eclipse. So their findings were that um, within 30 to 60 minutes of totality, uh, temperatures started to drop and they bottomed out within five to 10 minutes after totality ended. Why five to 10 minutes, you would say? Think of when the low temperature is for the morning, right? It's not right when the sun rises. It's usually a little bit after the sun rises. It's within 30 minutes to 45 minutes afterwards. And that's because the, the Earth is still emitting that long wave radiation out then the sun comes and balances it. But it takes a while for that balancing to stop. So 
you'll actually likely see temperatures um, continue to fall just after totality ends. And they saw that most of their sites dropped within four to eight degrees. Now, that's not a lot, but considering on a, on a daily basis, um, we may see, you know, out here where there's more moisture in the air, we may have a 15 to 20, 20 ish degree temperature range from morning to the, the afternoon, right? Um, so, four to eight, just saying that's 40 to 50% of our diurnal swing, um, it, it's pretty impressive just for one simple eclipse. So, these are the graphs, and they're, they're hard to see here. Um, these are, I can't even see it on there. These are 20 minute time steps, um, each one of these little hashes down here. So, <clears throat> This shows where uh, in Marion, Kentucky, they began, uh, or they, they topped out close to 92 degrees, and then right after totality, they dropped down to around 85 degrees. In Madisonville, Kentucky, they topped out just a, a touch above 92 degrees. The eclipse is coming, the temperatures are dropping as a result, totality, um, is where that little, this red line is. Um, they end up dropping down to about 86 degrees. I'm going to butcher this name here. It's Cape Gerardo, Gerardo, Gerardo. Somebody knows it, thank you. Cape Gerardo, um, sorry, Missouri. Uh, they top out at 90 degrees. And they actually had a, a pretty good fall. Um, they have dropped down to 82 um, right after totality. So that's almost 10 degrees. Excuse me, sorry, they, 90 down to 82 is 8 degrees. But so on that maximum, 4 to 8. And then Paducah itself, and this is um, at the airport there, a um, little bit higher uh, temporal resolution for the temperature graph, so that's why you see it spiking up and down a little bit more. Um, I'll say though, right at uh, 93 degrees and they drop down to 86. Um, so you can see that that is gonna be one of the major, uh, major things that we see with the eclipse um, coming up is temperature drop. And even if it's cloudy, it's still, it's still going to drop um, a considerable amount. So here is a satellite video of Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, um, Southern Kentucky during the 27th eclipse. Hopefully it plays here. So you'll see afternoon um, cumulus starts to build up, the eclipse comes, and then look right after totality. You see how much of the cloud cover uh, was actually dwindled and, and reduced. And so this is that energy budget, right? You remove the sun, you no longer have anything going out for that convection, that conduction. Um, you no longer have your gases, your water vapor absorbing um, some of that radiation and heating up the atmosphere. I'll, I'll play this again because it, it is pretty neat. So morning, start to see your, your daily fair weather cumulus. And admittedly, if this occurs uh, during our eclipse, it will give people anxiety because, you know, if you're under one of these cumulus clouds, you're, you're likely not going to see fatality. Um, even though, I'll preface it with, as totality comes and these clouds start to dwindle, but by the time, you know, totality ends up, moving past, um, these clouds may or may not still be there, maybe it'll thin out, um, but it could still ruin some, somebody's day. <laughs> Hopefully not ours, you know, driving here, it was beautiful. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'll show you now though, climatologically, it's, it's kind of a, a it's a coin toss, but 
Um, all right, so the second thing that we should see um, on uh, as a result of the eclipse is winds. And so I want to briefly touch on um, what makes wind gusts, why we have wind gusts, why they typically peak in the afternoon. And I'm going to show you two graphs. This was the, uh, the best thing I saw, and it, it looks like it actually came from a NBC affiliate in Dallas, Fort Worth. So I wish the Weather Service had a, a graph that looked similar, but we don't, so I stole it. Um, all right, so very briefly, and, and this is pretty, pretty intuitive, warm air rises from the ground, right? And we get that from the afternoon heating. We have mixing takes place, and what mixing is is essentially that. You have, let's say you're making a cake and you have, I don't know, whatever cakes are made of. Some Flour. <laughs> now I'm having a, a complete brain fart, but you got, you got your, your cake mixing, right? You put your flour, your eggs, your whatever. Um, they're stratified, they're separated. <laughs> you take your spatula and you start mixing them, okay? That's all that the atmosphere is doing, but it's doing it regularly. And what happens with that mixing is we have stronger winds aloft. And why do we have stronger winds aloft? Can somebody uh, give, me, give me your best guess? Thinner. Air is thinner, um, however, it's friction. So they're right. So somebody said there's nothing to stop it. Exactly. So you are usually always going to see wind stronger aloft, and that's why if you go up on a skyscraper and you're standing out on the observation deck, it's going to be likely a lot windier than it is at the ground. So you got stronger winds aloft. Now. What happens when that mixing occurs, we take some of these stronger winds and we now throw them down to the surface. So that's where you get your afternoon wind gusts from. So down here, it may be 20 mile per hour sustained wind, but up here, it's 40 miles per hour. Now with this mixing, you may have 20 sustained, but now you're gonna have gusts somewhere in the middle of that where you're going to get wind gusts, let's say 30. Another uh, way to look at this, and this is, this is definitely a meteorological uh, nerd time. <laughs> um, so this is what we would look at every day uh, as meteorologists, and this is called a skew T log P diagram. Skew T meaning temperatures are skewed at a 45 degree angle like this, and log P is logarithmic, the pressure is decreasing logarithmically, which does occur in the atmosphere. So essentially, you get these diagrams from weather balloons, and 92 offices, 92 out of the 122 offices in the country release weather balloons twice a day. Um, unfortunately, Northern Indiana is one of the offices that does not so I have released probably, if I had to guess, close to a thousand weather balloons that travel up a thousand or a hundred thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand feet before they burst. So I've released a lot of balloons. Now at the office I'm at, we don't release balloons, but um, other offices do. And so this line right here is temperature. This line right here is dew point, the green line. So dew point, measure of the moisture in the air. These little barbs right here are wind barbs. And so don't think too much about this, but this is the morning sounding, and this temperature with it going this direction means there is an inversion. So that means the ground is colder than the air above it, which is stable. So cold air near the surface because the earth has cooled overnight, get a little inversion. So what does that do? That keeps any strong winds higher up. You know, there's no mixing now because it's a stable layer. So this same site, and this is Albuquerque, um, so that's actually why it, they're starting higher up because Albuquerque's at a higher elevation. Just a side note. 
you get uh, mixing here during the day. So now we have temperature is now decreasing in a nice pretty, pretty path. So we have now warming surface. We have warming and drying. So you can see here how far, how separate these two lines are determines how much moisture there is in the atmosphere. So the closer they are, the more moist it is. So you got a dry layer here. Uh, you may have some clouds up here. You may have some clouds right here. Um, but as we get the mixing, we get drying and uh, warming that will occur at the same time. That's why wildfires out west happen in the afternoon. It's really hot, really dry. Winds come, blows fires really fast. But this mixing also brings winds down to the surface. So with this afternoon heating, now you see this barb is now 15 knots, so 17 miles per hour. Where here it was, because it's kind of facing this direction, it's hard to tell, but it looks like it's below five. So now with the afternoon, we've gone from five to 15. So that is What are my, those little symbols again that look like the five? The wind bars? These? Yeah. So these are, sorry, I, okay. um, I didn't really explain these too much. So wind barbs are one of the ways on a weather map we would look at wind speeds being um, annotated on a map. And you have the barb, so whichever way the flag is, is the winds coming from a particular direction. So here these are westerly winds, so they're winds coming from the west. The, each one of these long hashes on this flag, so to speak, are 10 knots. If it's a small hash, it's five knots. And so here, it's hard to see, but there's one, two, three, four. So I would say this is winds out of the west at 40 knots. With this little triangle stuck on it, that's a 50. So that's 50 knots. Up here, there's two triangles, or two flags, I guess you could say. So it's 100 knots. Um, this is one of the ways I could also describe that winds increase with height, typically. And up here, around 200 millibars, so where about a fourth or fifth of the atmosphere is above it and the rest is below it. Um, up here is where the jet stream would usually be, between 300 to 200 millibars. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. So you launch, not your station, but across the nation, all these weather stations are launching two per day, mm -hmm. 100,000 feet, and then they burst, and then they go, what, to the Atlantic Ocean? Are they biodegradable? It depends, yes and no. <laughs> Um, our old radiosons, they're, they're called radiosons, um, they had a little uh, bag on them with prepaid postage. So if somebody found them, they could throw them in that bag and send them back to one of our reconditioning centers. Um, now with the new radiosons, they're smaller. So they're about like yay big. Um, there is no bag on them, people can just toss them. As far as those being biodegradable, they are styrofoam and metal. Um, so no. The parachute that's attached to them is photodegradable, so sunlight will eventually degrade it. Um, so to answer your question, kind of part of it is biodegradable, some other parts not. Um, we do, they launch two a day um, during an approaching hurricane or a massive severe weather outbreak they may request us to launch what's called special soundings. So there could be three or four done in a day. This eclipse. All right, so let's just briefly talk about um, our upcoming solar eclipse. So these maps, and I apologize for these being very hard to see, 
Um, this one is of Indiana, and this is the totality map of Ohio. For Lima, um, we will reach totality at about 3.09 p.m., or to get really specific, 3.09 3 and 50 seconds. Um, and be in totality for um, just shy of four minutes. Um, the Just to our south there, uh, it looks like um, on the north side of Greenville, Ohio will have the, um, is in the contour for the, the most time for totality. So the farther you get on these periphery uh, parts of the totality, you're going to have less time um, of totality. Climatology, um, what is our cloud cover? I'll tell you, it's not great. So somebody uh, at one of our national centers went through and looked at the cloud cover climatology. And this is between April 1st and 15th. So it, it basically straddles um, April 8th, right? So it's looking over a 15 day period from 1979 to 2022. And it's saying between, oh, excuse me, and there's also a time constraint on here. So it's between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Uh, it is putting us in a 70 to 80 percent of the time we are under cloud cover. Okay, so that's not great. It's not bad, you know, if we look at it on a a positive side, you know, not pessimistically. If we look optimistically, we've got a 30 to 20% chance of clear skies. So this is another way of looking at it, and I apologize for there not being anything for Lima, um, but these climatology uh, were taken with airports, and I guess they were looking for um, enough data. So I tried to pick the surrounding um, locations and you'll see these terminology here overcast broken few scattered the overcast is exactly what it sounds like it's 100% cloud cover broken is 51% to 99% scattered is 25 to 50 and few is uh, 1 to 25% and clear is of course exactly how it sounds so, looking at these specific areas, and this is looking just at April 8th, um, over the course of, I believe it was also, yeah, so it's just shy of 30 year climatology. I'd say about 45 to 55% of the time, um, we have broken to overcast skies at these airports. Um, Again, let's say, let's look at Toledo here, 30% chance. So closer to the lakes um, has more favorable climatology. And you can see it on this map as well, where right around these lakes, you get these uh, lake breezes that kind of actually clear out in the afternoon. So you may have better luck if you went closer to Cleveland. But don't take my word for that. <laughs> so, does anybody have any question on the, the cloud climatology here? Does the length of the eclipse make a difference in your optical Great question. Yes. So, the eclipse in 2017, I was looking, I think it was. 70-ish miles was the width of totality, and this eclipse is like 120 miles, so it's wider, and it's also going to be a longer duration. So I should have put that in there that more than likely we will see slightly significant or slightly larger changes both in degrees and cloud cover reduction. So yeah, that's a great question. So it is longer. Um, longer totality and a larger totality. So it should have a little bit more effect on our weather. And aren't we going to be much earlier in the year than 2017? 
Was it in August? August. August. Allen County Fairfax. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So um, the drier we will be, the more likely we'll see a, a bigger temperature drop. Um, you'll likely see larger temperature drops in, let's say, like South Texas. Um, they saw that with the 2017 drop. There, there was a larger drop out west um, where we typically have drier. All right, so brief um, days in review, and, and I'm running low on time, so I'll try and breeze through these. The Wilmington, Ohio office took an afternoon snapshot from, it was about 10 or 11 years on April 8th. So, hey, look, now we have some analogs to look at. So April 10th, 2010, sorry, April 8th, 2010, <laughs> Ohio right here, was it good cloud cover? No. The following year, 2011, was it good cloud cover? No. What about the following year? Hey, look at that, 2012, we were in good shape. And I wish I had a check mark to throw in here, but Google Slides doesn't, so it's a circle. So the next year, 2013, bad. 2014, this could go either way. I'll let you guys be the decider. Um, Lima, Ohio is probably right around here. I went ahead, I called that a go. Um, you may have to go maybe slightly east. But, eh, it's borderline. The following year, nope. <laughs> the following year, nope. But look at 2017. So if we have the eclipse here, then we would have been great. The next year, again, this is, this is borderline because we have some high cirrus clouds moving in. So, Probably 30 minutes after this satellite photo, it was cloud. So this will be, if we get a situation like this, it's going to be eh, kind of nerve-wracking, and it will stress a lot of people out. The next year, nope. And uh, this is a satellite mosaic, so that's why we're kind of missing um, parts of the Great Lakes there. Following year, great. So 2020, smack dab in the middle of that virus that affected us all. Um, we were in great shape, right? Following year, negative. And I don't have the satellite photos for 2022, but I did take a look at them. They just looked not pleasant. It wasn't this type of color scale, so I didn't even add them. 2022, cloudy, and then last year on April 8th, we were good to go. So that's about 50-50, and that's why I said, looking at the past, um, recent years, is kind of a coin toss. First look at April 8th weather, and it, I have these on here. Don't even worry that you can't see them, um, because what I will say is that these go out to the morning of the 6th. So I have these up here, but they're not going to be useful whatsoever when it comes to forecasting the clouds. And the reason why I have them up here is just to kind of make a point that you may see one single model that shows cloud cover. You may see two models that show cloud cover. However, us meteorologists, like to look at a lot of different models. This is the European, but this ENS stands for ensemble. And here we have the control, which is the, the European that you usually would see. But then we have 49 other European models. And what this is, is computationally, we're not capable of getting a good snapshot beginning picture of the atmosphere. And if you look at chaos theory, you make little tiny initial condition changes and you run it out in the future and everything becomes garbage, right? That's what occurs with our atmosphere. 
And so if you don't have perfect assimilation, perfect initial conditions, you're gonna have errors moving out in the future. So what ensemble models do is they make little changes and little, what we call perturbations. So little, little changes to the initial conditions and then run it out. And so we can look at all of these, all of these different possible solutions and, and get more information out of it, we can get better confidence or lack of confidence. And in this case, you'll see that if I'm looking at, let's say this is Monday and Tuesday, this is 100% cloud cover. So these whites are cloudy and the dark blues are clear. You'll see all of these, I would have very high confidence that it's gonna be overcast. Or cloudy, right? Because all on this time step, all of these are cloudy. But you can see is when we get farther out, look at this. There is right in this window, there is, I don't know, close to 50% cloudy and 50% clear. This is the GFS. So this is a European model. This is the um, American model. Again, you can see where we start to get very wishy-washy when we get beyond seven days. And that's why at the National Weather Service, we only forecast seven days out. I wish this went out to April 8th so that I, I could show you guys, but. So this is, I can show you this because this is for April 8th. This is the GFS ensemble and this is the Canadian weekly models. Again, big differences. So this is about, eh, I don't know, 15,000 feet up in the atmosphere, what it looks like. And here, this is what we'd call like ridge of high pressure. So this is most likely clear. But over here, this is a trough, and this is more likely bad weather clouds. So this is valid on the evening, or the late afternoon evening of um, the eighth. This is what we call like zonal. So honestly, we could be in good shape here. Um, with this approaching high pressure, if this gets over us, um, we're more likely to have clear weather, less cloudy weather. However, you can see where this kind of contradicts it. If this ends up moving out a little faster and we can get this high pressure building in, then we're in good shape. This is the same uh, valid time period, but just the European ensemble. And you can see it kind of looks, at least for the ridging pattern up here, it looks a little bit like the GFS. So what I can gather from this is that there's not a big blue ball right over us that indicates that we have a trough or low pressure, because that would be pretty much guaranteed that we're socked in. These are just teleconnections. Um, again, I'm kind of getting in the weeds here, but this is the Arctic Oscillation. The Arctic Oscillation, when we get negative, um, tends to allow what we call, and us operational meteorologists hate this term because it's so publicized, but polar vortex, right? When we get negative, we get um, higher relative pressure up in the Arctic region, which weakens the winds and it allows cold air to reach down farther into the, the United States. So this is, uh, let me see where the eighth is, about halfway. Um, so the eighth is halfway. So you'll see that we have pretty good confidence that we would be in a negative phase that would tend to be colder and wetter um, for us. So hopefully we don't get like a snowstorm or anything. <laughs> um, but to be honest, like with this season that we've had so far, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, the North Atlantic Oscillation is, is another teleconnection that we look at. And this looks at, um, the Azores High uh, that's out in the North Atlantic, it's a, 
permanent, semi-permanent high pressure system and a semi-permanent low pressure system over Iceland. And the difference between that determines the phase and that, that leads to stronger westerly winds and whatever. So the main point here is that if we're in a negative phase, this also correlates with the Arctic Oscillation too. So we have two things here that suggest we're in negative phase, so we may be in a colder, at least a colder pattern. Now, wet is up for debate, but colder pattern for sure. Great. Okay. Am I good on time? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Now about, so that's the eclipse, and then and part of my title, right, said um, other interesting phenomena. So, rainbows. All right, we all know about rainbows, right? Or we've seen rainbows. So what is a rainbow? All right, we've got a raindrop, okay? The sun enters raindrop at A. So here's the sun, here is you, okay? Make sure that the sun is behind you and that the rain is in front of you. That is a gold standard requirement to see a rainbow enters the raindrop at A, and it refracts. And its refraction is called Snell's Law. I'm not gonna bore you with that, but if you wanna look it up, you can look it up. Um, so the light refracts, and it splits like a prism. So visible light contains all those wavelengths that I showed you earlier, right? Well, once it hits that different medium, it splits like a prism into the different wavelengths. And each color is its own wavelength, and it refracts differently. And I'll show you what it looks like uh, on the next slide. It refracts, hits, and reflects off of the back of the raindrop at B. It then travels back through the raindrop, exits the raindrop, and refracts because it's changing mediums, there's changing densities. So it exits the raindrop and refracts back towards the observer, AKA you. The angle that that occurs is 42 degrees. All right, so now you may think, and based on this slide, that, hey look, red comes out at the bottom. That doesn't make sense because a rainbow red is on top, and violet, or is it indigo? I think violet, cool. Violet is at the bottom. Well, it depends on which raindrop you are seeing. So the reason why red is on top is because you are looking at higher up raindrops and you're getting that red light from it. The lower raindrops, you're getting the violet. Does that make sense? So when you add those all together, you're receiving that different wavelength with respect to, you're receiving that wavelength of light from that particular drop. So one neat thing that a professor told me is each person is seeing their own individual rainbow. So, you can go and travel anywhere and you're seeing a different rainbow. This picture I took at Yellowstone um, a couple of years ago and I was driving this way and I looked in my rear view mirror and I'm like, oh, and pulled <laughs> off the side of the road and we jumped out and my wife and I took a whole bunch of pictures. Um, it's, picture does not do it justice. It was the most vibrant rainbow I've ever seen. It was ridiculous. You can actually see a double rainbow here, right, faintly. The difference of a single rainbow and a double rainbow is two different reflections off the back of the drop. And the colors are reversed, and you're seeing it on the outside arc. The reason why I mentioned 42 degrees is you are likely seeing 42 degree of the rainbow. If you remove the Earth, cut the Earth out, you see a full circle. But because the Earth is there is why it's an arc. Fall street clouds. 
These are one of my favorites. I've never seen them in person, but they're the coolest looking things in the world. Okay, so mid high level clouds consist of super cool water. So what is super cool water? It's water that is unstable. It's colder than 32 degrees, but it hasn't yet found anything to freeze onto. Okay, so these clouds are between 32 to negative, sorry, that is a, that should be an F. So I changed the, whatever. 32 to negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you got super cool, unstable clouds. They're water droplets, right? A plane comes through this cloud layer and automatically disturbs it. And instantly, these super cool water droplets freeze. And when they freeze, they create a cascading effect where they freeze going outwards. And by being ice now, they're heavier, they fall. So this is where you get the terminology of fall streak cloud or a hole punch cloud, whatever you want to call it. Here is an image, and I've done this. This is the coolest little science experiment that you can do at your house. Get distilled water. It has to be pure distilled water. Put it in the freezer for like an hour, hour and a half. Carefully remove it, and you'll see what happens. It's the coolest thing in the world. Super cool water, he disturbs it, and it turns the ice instantly. Here is another thing, flicking it. Coolest thing in the world, right? Hey, science. <laughs> Wait, how do I go past people? Okay, my final thing, and then I will shut up and let you guys ask questions, because I'm talking a lot. Noctilucent clouds. These are the coolest clouds, in my opinion. It's one of the coolest atmospheric phenomena, in my humble opinion. They are the Earth's highest clouds. What do I mean by that? So most of our clouds, we can think of maximum like 25,000 feet, right? Those high cirrus clouds. Typical cumulus clouds, 5,000 feet. These are 250,000 feet. These are really, really, really high clouds. They're not in the troposphere, they're not in the stratosphere, they're in the mesosphere, okay? Why can we see them? Well, we can see them when the sun is below the horizon and we are looking high up, okay? So essentially, the, earth, or the sun is illuminating these clouds and we've yet to see them, or we've yet to see the sun rise because the earth is round. What occurs and why these are even able to, to form in the first place, it's thought that um, meteorite or meteor dust um, provides the condensation nuclei, the nuclei for these droplets to form. You need the other things, the other ingredients would be water vapor, one of the ways to get water vapor is a rocket, right? So rockets provide us the water vapor. Um, there's another thing I had looked up, the uh, methane. Um, when methane breaks down, um, one of its byproducts is water vapor. So that's another source. And our Earth is slowly getting more methane, so these are more um, able to be seen. Typically, Without a rocket, you'll only see these in higher latitudes, and they'll only occur in the summer. Um, they occur in the summer because that's when the mesosphere is actually the coldest, and these occur at the top of the mesosphere. Um, it's coldest because the Earth, the lower atmosphere, is expanding and therefore pushing the mesosphere higher up, and so therefore it's colder. Um, what do these look like? And I saw these when I was in Tampa. And honestly, like the, the pictures here don't do it justice. So I saw these in Tampa. This was a, an hour or so after a Falcon 9 rocket at the Cape. 
And it was much darker than this. So when I took these pictures, it still looked dark outside, and these clouds looked blue. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. They're just the coolest thing in the world. And typically, because they're so high, and they're 230 to 260,000 feet up, you can typically see these um, from like the Carolinas, even. So even though this is somewhere off the, off the east coast of Florida, and I'm over on the west coast of Florida looking at them, um, people will typically observe and see these things even in the, the Carolinas. So if you're ever, and this is one thing I threw on here that you may or may not see, but if, uh, if you're lucky and there have been people that have spotted them in like Oregon, um, so they do sometimes work their way out to lower latitudes. Um, but be on the lookout, you'll see them usually right before uh, dawn. And um, yeah, they're just the coolest thing in the world. Questions? Yes, in the back. Do clouds turn black? So what you're actually seeing with a cloud is the sunlight um, going through the clouds. And so to answer your question, if it goes dark, you're likely just not going to be able to see really anything. Um, it's going to look kind of like really, really, really early dawn um, because you'll see light kind of on the way on the outskirts, outside of totality, basically. Um, so the clouds won't become black, but think of like a night sky. You can usually see, if you go outside and there's any sort of light at all, you can, you can usually see a little gray, maybe, with the clouds. Um, I'll say if they're high up clouds, like if they're the, your high cirrus clouds, 20,000 feet up or so, you probably won't see them at all. Does that answer your question? Ish. <laughs> yeah. Even white hat, though. Cool. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Did I put you guys to sleep? No. <laughs> Alright. Yes? I have a question about tornadoes. Okay. So one real recently. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they say they do they do they follow paths. So the last tornado went south of Lima, um, and it ended around Indian Lake, but all the way to Mercer County. And then sometimes they'll say things they worse, like there's a path there. And then sometimes people say it avoids Lima because of the refinery. Is there are there paths for tornadoes? I mean, do you see? How do they say? Do you see? Yeah, and, and is there any truth to the fact that sometimes they avoid Lima because of the refinery and all the steam? So, to my knowledge, and just based on just meteorology in general, I would say no, um, that there would be no correlation to that. Your weather systems and the amount of energy that goes into a cloud, the amount of late heat, the amount of energy being released, um, is substantial, like much larger than anything that a refinery can pump out. So you're not really gonna have, I would say, and, and I've received calls actually um, ahead of hurricanes where people are like, well, why don't you just go throw ice out in front of the, the storm? And the, the storm would just laugh at, at that ice and just keep going. Um, and, and we've seen storms actually increase in strength just from like the marsh over uh, the Everglades. Um, so I would say no on the, on the refinery. Following paths, um, if you ask the emergency manager in Van Wert County, Rick McCoy, he would say he is the tornado man. Um, great guy, he's, he's awesome, uh, he's a great EM there. Um, but no, it's really just a, it's a chance thing. Um, topography, they've seen tornadoes travel mountains or traverse up mountains. Um, a lot of people would used to used to think that you know you'd be fine higher up on a on a mountain that tornadoes don't climb topography, but they do. 
Um, so I really think it's just a chance thing. And I would say we lucked out. Um, you guys are in our forecast area, Wilmington, uh, overseas, Oglaze and Mercer and um, Logan counties. And then Cleveland is farther up there. Um, and the tornado down in Winchester too uh, is Indianapolis's forecast area. So really what, what was driving that was a stalled boundary. So wherever that boundary was, was where those supercells fired up and they just kept training along that boundary. So um, that's why we kind of dodged, I think a bullet there is that boundary was a little bit south of Lima. So. Yes? So the angle that they're coming out, so the angle that they enter the raindrop and exit the raindrop um, right there is 42 degrees. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, so really what you're seeing here, so you're seeing a 2D image here. Think of the light that comes out of this as a circular cone. And so in order to see a rainbow arc like that, you're receiving, uh, these raindrops are putting out that circular cone. You're receiving the light coming out this side of the raindrop, if you're looking at this part of the rainbow. It's kind of, <laughs> without like a 3D object, it's kind of hard to, hard to explain. Um, but yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to explain without like a, a circular raindrop. But um, I'm trying to think how to explain that better. And I don't have it. Let me think about it, and then I'll, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> is, is, it, is it kind of like, so imagine a flashlight, right? Yeah. You have a flashlight up here, and the flashlight's pointing at you. You see the flashlight. Now, you see pictures where you see somebody who takes the flashlight, and they move them, and they create a line, right? So imagine when you're looking at it, it's that line happening all at the same time right to your face. Does that kind of make sense? A little more? No, that's, that's an excellent way. So you shine the flashlight. If I shine a flashlight over here to her, she's seeing the bottom part of that flashlight beam. If I come over here and I shine the flashlight, right, she's seeing the left side of that flashlight beam. Eh. <laughs> so... Yeah, hopefully. So, I don't, it's, a, it's a good question. And it's, you know, I had like, I had a professor that was overly passionate about rainbows, like to a fault, like obsessed with rainbows. And so we, I got rainbows drilled into my head more than I, I cared about um, at Florida State early in my collegiate career. So he really loved his rainbows and he would probably be able to give you a, an analogy just like that, but. I don't have it on the top of my head. <laughs> yes? Um, rainbows get color. Rainbows get color, so light, the light that you see from the sun, don't go out and stare at the sun, but the light that you see from the sun contains all of those colors. And right when it hits that raindrop, it splits. Um, if, have you ever seen like a, a prism and shined a light at it and it splits? into um, multiple colors. I'd show you like the Dark Side of the Moon Pink Floyd album cover. Um, have your dad show you that. So <laughs> that, would, uh, that would split. Um, so light splits into all those different color spectrums. All right. 
Well, I'll still be here for a couple of minutes, so if something pops in your head, let me know. Thank you. All right, I'm taking the handheld. Um, thank you so much, Dustin, for sharing uh, your incredible wisdom and insight into our Midwesterners' favorite topic, all, all forms of weather, um, and why we should be paying attention to the weather on when, when totality hits our neighborhood. So thank you all uh, for attending tonight and for supporting the Eclipse Science Series it really is an exciting time to be living in Northwest Ohio, where the best seats in the path of totality are in our own backyards, hopefully without a lot of cloud cover or trees getting in the way. Um, every speaker that we've had in this science series has emphasized the importance of safety. And just to make that a little bit easier, please stop by one of the tables out front for both a cookie, which is really important, but also a pair of certified Eclipse glasses from the Ohio State University Planetarium. So I wanna say thank you so much. I have so enjoyed listening to all of these speakers. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to learn more about the weather and uh, have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you.